I have the task of introducing our preacher for this moment, and it is a task that I am excited about. Um, if you don't know Kenneth Michael Young, you need to get to know him. He is absolutely a rising star, not because he's a Gordon Conwell alum <laughs> one time, not because he's a Gordon Conwell alum two times, but because he's a man of God and one who certainly I am well pleased within and certainly many of us are proud of. He hails from Sylvester, Georgia by way of Macon, Georgia, and in 2010 matriculated from the American Bible College uh, with majors in Bible and theology uh, with a concentration in religious studies. While there, he served at the Mount Zion Baptist Church under the able leadership of Bishop Joseph Walker III. And there, Reverend Young was an overseer of Christian education for the college ministry. And then upon matriculating in 2010, we received him with open arms. And he came here to Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary and matriculated once with a master's in church history, matriculated again with a master's in religion, and is presently the senior associate minister or senior associate pastor at St. John's Congregational Church in Springfield, Massachusetts, where he serves under the very able leadership of uh, Dr. Calvin J. McFadden. Uh, he is a member of so many organizations and doing great civic and philanthropic work. Uh, while he was here at Gordon Conwell, he was a Michael Haynes scholar, he was a Byington scholar, he was a member or is a member of uh, Theta Alpha Epsilon Honor Society and certainly one of the past presidents of the Black Student Association. Uh, his ambition and what we can be praying for him and with him for is to pursue a doctorate in African American studies and, and religion, and theology, and he feels called not only to the pastorate, but also to the professoriate. And so we pray for him. I will share with you that he is certainly one who understands the power of thinking theologically, of engaging globally, and living biblically. He is married to uh, Adrienne D. Gladden, and together they are living a life that God is blessing bountifully. I share with you that if you know Reverend Kenneth Michael Young, you know that he is amicable, he is personable, he has full charisma, and he's a fun, loving guy. I, I share with you also that if you know Reverend Kenneth Michael Young, you know that he's a man of God and a prayer warrior. Let us receive the word of God by God's servant and our brother, the Reverend Kenneth Michael Young. Wow. <laughs> what an introduction. Let us pray. Father God, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we just want to tell you thank you on today. Lord, we want to tell you thank you for your grace and your mercy. God, where would we be without your grace and your mercy? <clears throat> God, I pray that you are here with us in this sacred space. Lord, help your servant behind this sacred desk to preach your word with holy boldness, to preach your word with power and conviction. Lord, use my feeble words to encourage someone on today. Lord, we are here because we need a word from you. We are here, that's why we've come. So speak, Lord, your children are listening. Speak, Lord, that's why we are here. It's in Jesus' name we do pray, amen. Amen, it's indeed an honor and a privilege to stand before you, um, my friends, my professors, and close classmates. It's good to be in the house of the Lord one more time. So if you don't mind, please uh, give me your hallelujah, your amens. <laughs> As the old saints say, help the preacher out. So I'm, I'm going to uh, preach in my own black church tradition 
And the, the scripture that was read into your hearing, Jeremiah 29 and 11, you heard the climax of that text. Um, the text is taken from, I, w- I would say, from verses 4 through 11. So I would like to read just uh, verse 11 again. He says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare and not for evil. To give you a future and a hope. For a few moments that I have with you, i like to share with this thought in mind. It's all in his plans. It's all in his plans. Well, son, I'll tell you, life for me ain't been no crystal stair. It had tacks in it and splinters, boards torn up, places with no carpet, bare. All the time, I've been climbing on. I've been reaching landings and turning corners and sometimes going in the dark where there's been no light. So, boy, don't you turn back. Don't you sit on, sit down on the steps, because you find it kind of hard. Don't you fall now, while yeah. I'm still going, honey, still climbing. Life for me ain't been no crystal stair. This famous poem was written by Langston Hughes during the Black Renaissance. Hughes, in this poem, depicts a mother telling her son that life is not always easy. Life is not always a crystal stair. Life sometimes has tacks that punctures our spirit. Life sometimes has splinters that irritates us. Life is not always a shiny crystal. As my grandmother would say, sometimes life serves you issue serves you pain but you have to learn how to overcome those things the truth of the matter is there's one thing about life that I know be sure that you experience pain and suffering in life but you have to allow God to help you endure the pain and the suffering so the question is how do you handle life when life is not going your way How do you handle life when it seems as if life is not doing the things that you want it to do? How do you handle life when life is not going going according to your five-year plan? I hear some of you saying, I I thought I would be further along than this. I thought I would be married by now. I thought I would have the degree by now. And life is not going the way I had it planned out. Sometimes life serves us rainy days, stormy days on this journey. The question is, can I trust God while I'm suffering? God, what am I supposed to learn while I'm going through the pains and the storms of life? This text, these are questions that the children of Israel are asking. This text has to be put in proper context. In order for you to understand that they are hurting before they hear the reassurance of hope that God has a plan for them. They're wondering how can a loving God do this to his children? How can God our Father allow this to happen to us? And I'm sure you've had those same questions. You've been wondering, God, why? Did you allow this to happen to me? God, why did you allow this pain to come into my life? You've asked God those questions. You're just like the children of Israel in this text. You've asked God, why did you allow storms to roll in my life? Well, when we look at the text, children of Israel ended up in this predicament. Because they did not do the things that God called them to do. And sometimes God uses life circumstances to place us in a place where we've lost 
focus. Sometimes God used life circumstances to push us right where he wants us to be. So now we're not worried about distractions. God says, I have your full attention. Sometimes we're so distracted about by things that's going on around us. God said, I have to get you to a place that you'll focus on me. I have to get you to a place where you'll focus on me and me alone. I want your full attention. Text says that God sent them or he carried them away captive. The text says that he carried them away captive to Babylon. The good news is that they may be in Babylon, but God is the one that carried them away. So it doesn't matter where they are. God is the one that's controlling the situation. Sometimes in our own life, we're wondering what's going on, and God is saying, the good news is that I have my hand on your situation. It may seem bad right now. It may look bad right now. It may be dark right now. But I'm the one that's doing this. I'm the one that got my hand on you. Let me see if I can help somebody with this. When I was a child, I didn't always do the things my parents told me to do. I was a good kid, but not a great kid. <laughs> so there were times when I did not complete my chores. There were times when I did not do the things that my parents left for me to do. And so my parents would spank me. I knew that my parents loved me and they wouldn't do anything to hurt me. But the spanking was to push me into a place where they wanted me to be. And sometimes God allowed the pains of life. Sometimes God allowed suffering in life to push us right where he wants us to be. Listen to the text. The text says that he carried them away captive. It seems as if God is hurting his people, but God is pushing them into a place where he wants them to be. Jeremiah is trying to convey to the people that you have to be focused on not what you're going through, but what you're going to. Sometimes we are focused on so much, so many things that we are going through in the now, and God is saying, I'm trying to get your vision on what you're going towards. Yeah. You may be hurting right now, but I'm trying to push you to a place to where I want you to be. Come on, come on. I can remember when I was in high school and I played basketball, uh, the coach used to make us run all types of sprint, and we would be tired, I mean gasping for air. Sometimes end up with toilet horses and cramps, and we would hurt after practice, but the coach was trying to prepare us for the game. And sometimes in life, God may be seemingly hurting you, may seem like pains are hurting you, but God is trying to prepare you for life's journey. Jeremiah told his people, where you are in captivity, that's where I placed you. I got my hand on the situation. He says that you can't listen to those who are telling you that you shouldn't have any pain. You can't listen to those who are telling you that you shouldn't suffer. Text says that he, he says there are false prophets. There are false teachers who are, who are prophesying falsely to you. They keep telling you that you won't suffer a long time. They are lies. Don't listen to them. He says that I'm the one that's causing these pains. I'm the one that's causing you to suffer through this. This spoke to me. Because in this 21st century, we don't like to go through anything. In this 21st century, we live out the motto, you can have it your way. We get upset when the internet is not moving fast enough to go to our website. We get upset when we are standing in a fast food line and the line is not moving quick enough. 
we get upset even when we put things in the microwave and we watch the time as if it's going to make the time move faster. Sometimes we don't like being in a place where we are at a standstill in life. And God is saying this is not going to move fast. This is not going to be easy. But you got to go through this. Because I'm trying to shape you. I'm trying to mold you. I got my hand on you. And it's in my plans to put you right where I want you to be. You got to go through it. You got to live through it. I know this is not a popular message in the 21st century church, but we have to learn that things are not always quick and easy. Your degree would not always be quick and easy. You got to stay up late at night, burn the midnight oil so you can get what God wants you to have. Yes, sir. <laughs> Jeremiah says you're going to have to go through those things. But he tells them that while they're in captivity, that they have to produce in their prison. Yeah, 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 yeah. Wow. Yeah. The audacity of God. Yeah. <laughs> Tells them they're going to have to produce while they're held captive. Doesn't it seem like God would have told them to build houses, plant gardens, marry and have kids after they left Babylon? Doesn't it seem as if God would say you can be productive when you're outside of your confinement? You can be productive when you're outside of your prison. But the text says that he tells them to build houses, plant gardens, marry, and have kids. He's saying to them, while you're hurting, while you're in your pain, you got to be productive. You got to continue to produce even when things are not going the way you want them to go. So what is he saying? Maybe he's saying you may not be in the position that you want to be in, but you got to be productive. You may not be living in the place that you want to live in, but you got to be productive. You can't stop life and sit on the roadside of life because you're having pains and struggle. God says you got to be productive. And a lot of times we want to groan and moan. We want to gripe and complain about the things that we are going through. But God is saying while you're going through it, you have to be productive. God calls us to be productive in our agony, in our pain, in our turmoil. God calls us to be productive wherever we are. You have to learn how to be productive. Text says that you got to Build houses. You got to plant gardens. You got to marry and have kids. You got to be productive because you'll be there for a while. You got to learn how to be productive when it hurts. You got to learn how to be productive when you're suffering. But here's the climax of the text. Text says in verse 11, the good news is, for I know the plans that I have for you. They've gone through this hurt, this pain. They have gone through this suffering. And he says at the end, for I know the plans that I have for you, says the Lord. He's letting them know regardless of what it looks like, regardless of what you're going through, I know the plans I have for you. The I in the I know is emphatic, as if he's saying, don't listen to nobody else. Don't listen to anybody else. I know the plans I have for you, my child. I I, I know what you're enduring. I know the pain that you're struggling with. I know, and I have plans for your life. I like this because he's saying that regardless of the situation that you've been placed in the primary care of the creator. I've got plans for you. As if he's saying, I've got everything in my plans. I have everything in my control. He's reassuring them that I haven't forgotten about you. 
I haven't turned my back on you. I haven't closed my eyes. I haven't turned a blind eye towards you. You are my children, and I know the plans that I have for you. And things may be chaotic, but I'm over the chaos. Yeah. Things may be out of control, but I'm always in control. I know the plans that I have towards you. Yeah. You can leave out of this chapel on this morning knowing that there's a chaotic world that we are facing and have the reassurance yeah. that God is in control. Yeah. You can leave out of this chapel on this morning being encouraged and knowing that regardless of how things may look and regardless of how it may seem that God is still in control. He's in control because the text says that he has to perform his good word towards the children. Yeah. He's saying that I got to keep my side of the covenant. See, I promised your father Abraham that I will make his name great. And if I leave you in captivity to die, I'll be losing on my side of the covenant. I wouldn't be keeping my promise towards your father. I got to keep my side of the covenant. So he says, I'm going to allow you to be here for 70 years, but after that, after you've gone through the storms, after you've gone through the rain, I'm going to place you back where you're supposed to be. And I don't know about you on this morning, that's good news to me. That regardless of what you've gone through, God says there's a time limit on your struggle. There's an expiration date on your pain. So regardless of what it looks like right now, God says, I'm going to allow you to go through it. But after you go through it, I'm going to put you right where I want you to be. The text says that after you're done with going through this time in exile, I'm going to prosper you. I like this. He says, I'm going to give you a hopeful future. When this time is over. After the pains are done, I'm going to put you right where I want you to be. So how does this apply to us on this morning? Are we like those exiles? We like them are not in our home. Our home is with God. But like them, we have God has a purpose for our being here. We like them. We may live in an intimate relationship with God through Jesus Christ, even during a period of exile. Like them, God redeems our suffering. God redeems our trials. God uses all of those things so that he can get the glory. We have a promise from Jesus himself that he is with us, having overcome the world, every believer can have the shalom of God. Every believer can have confidence in his sovereign control of all events. So the good news is that we can't worry about how God is going to do a thing. We just got to have confidence in knowing that God's sovereign hand is still working. Amen. Amen. So I would hit the season saying, saying in my church, trouble in my way. I had to cry sometimes. Yeah. Trouble in my way. I laid awake at night. But that's all right. Because I know Jesus will fix it after a while. Yeah. That was the hope yeah. of my ancestors. Yeah. That regardless of what was going on in their lives, they know that Jesus would fix it right. after a while. Yeah. Yeah. So the question is, how do you still have hope? You've been suffering for a while. How do you contend with the pain and continue to worship God? How do you deal with the stuff that's going on in this world? How do you continue to suffer, but you continue to go to church Sunday after Sunday after Sunday? You continue to lift up your hands towards God, knowing that the world is not treating you right. How do you do that? Well, I had to call my grandmother. 
I had to talk to my grandmama. I said, Grandma, you, you lived through times where you, there was white-only fountains and yeah, yeah. black-only fountains. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You lived in the time where you had to go to the back door to get fed. Yeah. You lived in a time where you saw your brothers and your sisters beaten by the police. Yeah. How did you continue yeah. to have hope? How did you continue yeah. to trust God in your suffering? Yeah. Well, she gave me one word, y'all. You want to hear what she said? Yeah. She said, Jesus. She said, Jesus was talked about. And if they talked about Jesus, they're going to talk about you. They pierced Jesus in the side. They whipped him all night long. They put him on an old rugged cross. She said, that's the reason I can have hope. We thought we were past all of these trials and tribulations. We thought we were past segregated cities. We thought we were past shootings in our street. We thought we were past terrorism in our own communities. We thought we were past churches being burned. But in the last few years, we've seen black men being shot like animals. Freddie Gray in Baltimore killed in the street. Eric Garner screamed, I can't breathe. Killed in New York City. The shooting in our own sacred space of worship in Charleston, South Carolina, in Mother Bethel. We see swastikas spray painted on the University of Missouri. She said, the reason why I can handle all that's going on today is because Jesus went through all of that. And I can hear the deacon saying, must Jesus bear the cross alone? And all the world goes free. No, there's a cross for everyone. And there's a cross for me. They will continue to say that they hung him high. And they stretched him wide. He hung his head. For me and you, he died. They say he didn't stay in the grave. But he got up with all power in his hand. And because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives. All fear is gone, for I know who holds my future, and life is worth the living just because he lives. I can live because I know God still sits high and he looks down low. I can live because I know God is still in control. I can live because I know he's omnipotent. I can live because I know he's all-powerful, and life is worth the living because he lives. Father God, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we want to tell you thank you. Lord, thank you for every trial. Thank you for every tribulation. Because God, you, you're molding us, you're shaping us into what you want us to be. God, the truth of the matter is that some of us wouldn't even pray to you if we didn't go through any pain. Come on. Come on. Truth of the matter is, God, sometimes we wouldn't even crack open your living word if we didn't go through any trial or tribulation. So, God, regardless of the suffering, we still have hope in you. Yes. We know that you are in control. God, we know that you are omnipotent. We know that you see all. We know that you are everywhere. God, we know that even in the pain, you are right here with us. That you just don't sit and look at us suffering, but you come down with us in our hurts. When no one sees us crying, you are there. When no one sees the, the spirit being broken, God, you are there. When no one can see the words that are angrily spewed towards us. God, you are there. And so, God, we are grateful that you are living, God. God, we are grateful that your son suffered for every one of our sins. Your son was beating, bruised, and battered just for us. And God, we have hope in knowing 
that if your son was able to go through that, we were able to go through the same. We are able to bear our cross and be productive in our pain. We can latch on and hinge on to the hope of knowing that it's in your plan and that you are in control. Lord, bless everyone here. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.